we're going to welcome our next speaker. I get to say Swiss German greeting, hoi. Hoi, <laughs> Regula Wurzler. Uh, Regula Wurzler is a uh, artist who lives and works in Switzerland and Zurich. She's sponsored by Swissnex and uh, she currently has an exhibition up at the Swissnex Institute, the one I mentioned earlier, called Place Makers. And uh, she is going to take us through a, uh, uh, a failed launch uh, of Apple uh, Maps and uh, she's going to reveal the aesthetic uh, bounty that was produced by this failed launch. And uh, uh, her talk is entitled A Trip to the Never Never Land of Apple Maps, and I believe we have the slideshow ready to go here. All right. So please <laughs> welcome Regula Mosler. Hello. Um, first of all, um, thank you, Image and Location. Thank you, Swissnex, for having me. Um, I will talk about my art project called The Rendering Eye. And um, according to our location here, I chose a title that is a little bit more complex than the one you just read here. The title is um, It Never Rains in California, A Trip to the Never Never Land of Apple Maps. And you're going to see why I choose this title very soon. And my name is Regula Wuchsler. Sort of a difficult name here. In June 2012, at the Worldwide Developers Conference, Apple executive Scott Forstall slid his fingers over an iPad to show a feature of a new app called Flyover. With a few twitches of his fingers, Forstall took command of a photo reel 3D recreation of San Francisco and flew the audience around the city skyscrapers. And his demonstration was part of the announcement that Apple would soon, together with its new iOS 6, publish its own map service. The technologist's journey to that event began in 2007 when the Swedish-based enterprise Saab created a company called C3 Technology. With this company, Saab intended to market the 3D mapping technique it had developed for supporting guided missiles to hit their targets. Now that the technique had been declassified, Saab wanted to sell it outside the defense industry. In July 2011, C3 technology was acquired by Apple for an undisclosed sum. That's what happened to the website then. And uh, launching its own map service um, would allow Apple to remove Google Maps from its mobile devices, to tighten its control over what people did on them, and in the long run, to sell advertisements embedded into these maps. About this purchase, Apple wrote, the Sweden-based company's automated software and advanced algorithms enable C3 technology to rapidly assemble extremely precise 3D models and seamlessly integrate them with traditional 2D maps, satellite images, street-level photography and user-generated images that together are forever changing how people use maps and explore the world. In order to gather the necessary data for the 3D renderings, Apple began to send planes to fly over several American cities and take aerial photos. Four digital single lens reflex cameras, of the kind found in any camera store, were mounted into a rig and fixed in a plane so that when the aircraft patrolled up and down, it captured views of the four aspects of every piece of terrain and structure on it. An unknown number of additional cameras in the rig were positioned to capture extra overlapping images from their own angles. To cover a city of the size of San Francisco, it took the plane an hour. The launch of Apple Maps in September uh, on September 12, 2012 was not the moment of triumph Apple had hoped for. Instead of photoreal images of the world, users found surrealistic cityscapes featuring undulating highways and collapsed bridges. Reuters, uh, the international news agency, called it nothing less than a disaster. Two weeks later, Apple CEO Tim Cook did something that rarely happens in Cupertino. 
he posted a letter on Apple's website apologizing for the errors. Shortly after the launch, a friend of mine introduced me to Apple Maps and he delightfully pointed out all the errors he had discovered. But my experience was totally different. During most of my professional life, which as you can guess from looking at me, spans over quite some time, I had worked with all sorts of pictures in television, in exhibitions, historical research and books. I also had tried to teach students how to deal with pictures, how to read and understand them, and how to be critical of what they see. Over time, when I was looking at the new picture, I felt that I might not know this very picture, but that for sure I knew the sort of picture it belonged to. Flying around in the 3D world of Apple Maps for the very first time, I felt that I had never before seen this kind of representation of, representation of our world. I couldn't quite explain what happened to me, but I was utterly fascinated by what I saw, and I wanted more of it. So the following morning, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not easy on that normally, I was buying my own iPad and started exploring this new world. For the next couple of months, I spent hours and hours on my sofa with my new toy, which in fact was my own private airplane. At this time, the cities available in 3D were almost all American or Canadian. So I flew over them and around their skyscrapers. I dived into their streets and explored the industry and the wastelands on their fringes. During all of my explorations, I was taking pictures in the form of screenshots, hundreds of them, then thousands. These views of urban America seemed poetic and frightening, true and unreal, hyper-realistic and surrealistic at the same time. They were images of our reality, but they were generated far away from this reality. In high res resolution cameras, on planes, in highly secured computer systems and server farms, in the global data and computer network of the internet, in my living room, between my fingers and in my head. Oops, that was a bit. I soon discovered that certain rules apply to this modern never never land, as I would call it. It never rains. It never snows. Mississauga in Michigan, for example, lives in an eternal blissful autumn, the trees resembling flamboyant sculptures rather than plants. It's never dark in this world. And also, there is no horizon to be seen. Until now, the software only allows the user to look at it from straight down, down to an angle of about 45 degrees. These features are quite obvious, but in the world of Apple Maps, we also find a time that is different from the one that normally structures our life. I mean, Greg is making fun of me because as a Swiss person, I'm always talking about like times and watches and clocks as yesterday <laughs> evening. <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> I tell you there is a reason for it and you're gonna see it right now. <laughs> it's not just me because I'm Swiss that I'm so like fixated on clocks. <laughs> because in the world of Apple Maps, we find that um, one could call the time that we find their dream time similar to the time in Alice's Wonderland and in the famous painting called The Persistence of Memory from Spanish painter Salvador Dali. Despite being highly automated, the technology behind Apple Maps still requires humans to check its work. Without this so-called reality check, strange errors occur, making us think that we are in a world of dreams and fairy tales. Please have a look at the two clocks. <laughs> and here the same. The image processing algorithms that work out the 3D structures are capable of mathematical feats beyond any human, but they lack the common sense ability to notice with only a brief glance any form of incongruity, like the different times 
indicated by the clock faces of a clock tower. Another so-called error of Apple Maps show other errors of, uh, of Apple Maps show that for all its realism, the 3D image processing algorithms mash up images taken at different moments in time. So here the containers, you see like the first time that, that the plane flew by, all the containers were still there. And then when the plane came by the next time, part of the containers, they had been removed. Mm -hmm. And if you take like the four different images of this moment taken in different mom uh, moments of time, that is the result that you will have in Apple Maps. And by doing so, Apple Maps create a world that is in its core deeply estranged and alienated. Other images are a very peculiar mixture of hyperrealism and surrealism, especially when it comes to organic structures that are still too complex to be rendered in an adequate way. Another feature in the world of Apple Maps is the misalignments which occur when two-dimensional dimensional images, having been taken from above, are applied to the surface of a three-dimensional model. A camera on a plane overflying a city and its structures cannot see and capture what lies under, let's say, a highway or a bridge. So the program makes assumptions of what could be there and fills the voids, the blind spots, with an extrapolation of the surroundings and by doing so creates, again, a world of its own. The world of Apple Maps is divided into two different worlds. One is a place of fancy 3D locations, while the other consists of two-dimensional satellite photography, mostly blurred and often covered by clouds. These two worlds collide and create a new frontier that will unfurl its true nature in the future once Apple adds information to the 3D world and develops it as a privileged location in the digital world. Eleventh March 2014 was for me an important day because in a gallery space in Zurich I presented for the first time a selection of prints from the Rendering Eye project to the public. In order to fight my nervousness, I decided to go for a walk in the digital world, like I had done during the previous month. But the world was not the same anymore. The world, my world, had been updated. <laughs> Colors were different. The light had been changed. The surface looked different. And for the first time, human beings appeared in this world. <laughs> Apple clearly tried to make its maps more photorealistic with, I think, still mixed, mixed success. <laughs> <laughs> for me, the update was an almost unbelievable historical coincidence. While I was hanging the lost prints onto a white wall of a gallery space, Apple converted them into historical documents. All the thousands of screenshots I had taken could not be found any longer on Apple Maps. They were gone forever. And I'm a historian, I have to say, so I was really shocked by this, you know, that within one and a half year, pictures I had been taken had been converted from, let's say, art to historical documents. I mean, this is such a short, short span of time because normally historians we try to look, uh, uh, you know, like over a century or two or three, but like a year for a historian is virtually nothing at all. So my art project had metamorphosed, me metamorphosed into a historical project, documenting, documenting the short moment in time in the ongoing digitalization of our world. During the last two years while working on the Rendering Eye project, I often asked myself, what exactly am I doing here? What are these machines doing to me, to my way of looking at the world? 
who programmed these pictures, who determined their colors, who defined the visibility threshold, who wrote the algorithms to display of light and shadow, that is so picturesque. And by doing so, how does Apple Maps change my image of the world? The world of Apple Maps is abstract, machine-generated and cold. But thanks to their errors, the blurred lines, distortions and mirror effects, the pictures seem to have been created by a paintbrush in human hands. Moreover, many of the pictures remind me of well-known works of art. And this observation leads me to the last part of my presentation. It's the question, is the machine the new artist? Because artists create new visions of the world. They offer us a new interpretation of the places we live in. By sharing their vision, they often change the way we see the world. But isn't Apple Maps doing the same? Is the machine therefore the new artist? Can a machine paint a picture? Can it deliver an interpretation of our world? Can it create art and therefore influence the way we look at our world? These questions may seem strange to you, but let me show you some of my pictures that led me to think this and you will, and you will decide for yourself. Thank you very much for your interest. <laughs> and if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. But I have to admit that I have more questions than answers myself. So maybe you could also answer my questions. <laughs> and uh, I, that, would me, that would make me very happy. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're still looking for somebody from Apple to help you sort these things out, right? Absolutely, but they didn't show up yesterday night, and I don't know if they're here. They're or here, they just can't tell you anything because okay. of non-disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you. But they're very interested in your work, so um, let's, let's see. Like um, in a positive or negative way? <laughs> we have a question right there. Um, let's get started. Okay. Here you go. This question may be a little obvious. Um, you talk about the machine making the art. However, you were intervening with the machine and making choices based on presumably a wide knowledge of art. So there is a little bit of um, collaboration between you and the machine? No, the absolutely, absolutely. Because I'm the one having like all these pictures from uh, uh, art, from my, all my art history classes in my head. And that's why I do discover all these pictures that resemble, that resemble uh, um, all these uh, very well-known uh, uh, works of art, absolutely. But I'm still amazed, you know, by the uh, interpretation of the world that machines and algorithms and uh, uh, these like Apple Map programs can give to us because they seem to me to have something really artistic. I maybe have to add that like all the pictures you saw right now, I'm not changing them at all, you know. This is really what you find out there if you, ha if you take a time and, and, and look for these images. The only thing I do, like I, I frame them logically. I mean, I, I, I make the choices and I add like a little bit, a little de-distortion because of the angle of the 45 degrees. When you have like the high rise buildings, they collapse a little bit. And so uh, I apply like the distortion filter, but that's all what I'm doing, you know. So all the colors and, and like all the distortions and whatever you, you find there, this is exactly what, what you find when you go out there. 
cool, thanks. Next question, yes? Hi, I really liked what you did with uh, the renderings from Apple Maps. I was wondering if you had a chance to look at the company Travel by Drones. It's actually coincidentally founded by um, a Swiss-based man. It's a drones that have high-res video that travel all over the world. I know some people from ATH Zurich and they're working with drones. They're doing like mapping of, of, of uh, uh, they're mapping uh, 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 Swiss geography and, and like recreate uh, uh, geography and stuff like that. I don't know the project you're talking about. It's a really interesting website. It's called Travel by Drones and you can literally just pinpoint anywhere on the map of the world and watch a video okay. uh, from different like two dimensional and three dimensional renderings. Cool, thank you very much. I'll have a look at that. All right, there's one question right up front here, uh, Elizabeth. You talked about the method that the Apple planes uh, took as they're taking the photograph. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about if you had a method for your exploration through the maps or if you were sort of randomly exploring different places and kind of how you approach your own. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like first you have to know uh, um, like what cities are rendered in 3D because big parts of the world are still in 2D but there are like lists outside, and, uh, uh, lists on the internet and uh, people keep adding like new places that, that, that they come up with in 3D. And uh, I mean, I really started totally randomly, you know. And then after a certain time, like when you spend enough, enough time in a place, I really feel like having been there, you know, then you go back and you start knowing, okay, there they have the river and that there's the industry and whatever. And you're going back and, uh, um, like, and, and going back several times, you start seeing stuff that you didn't, didn't see in the beginning. It's like when you go to a, uh, travel to a city, you know, first you're overwhelmed and you, you know nothing about that city. And, and the more you spend time there, the more you, you can discover like little details. But it's not very, uh, um, I do it mainly for my pleasure too, because it's so pleasing to my eyes, what I, what, what I, found, what, what I find out there. Mm -hmm. And also what I do not do, I mean, a, a lot of people working like um, uh, with Google Maps, they always give you the location, the exact location, you know, and that's not what I'm really interested in. I don't really care where it is. I mean, I know like from all the places where they are because I have the record, but I'm, I'm more like interested in, in the transformation and what all these pictures do to the way we look at the world. So it doesn't really matter where, where, where these specific places are. Hmm. One more question right there, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. I really, uh, I really loved your presentation and these images are astounding. Despite my accent, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> So, and I think you're very right that you were able to seize these images in a special transformative period uh, where there's like a window we sort of can catch them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that chance uh, as a principle of creation uh, would be one of the things that we can think about when it comes to uh, the creation of these things. Um, in photography, um, there's also been a number of very fascinating images produced by bad mobile telephones mm -hmm. uh, not mm -hmm. being able to you know uh, produce real uh, good images and cinematographers uh, of our time actually c collecting bad older mobile telephones because they provide these strange visions and ha they have uh, a strange intensity mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. their expression mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this is also like a short window because uh, for example, uh, Lars von Trier's um, latest film was shot partly on with an iPhone, mm -hmm. but uh, that provides now too high quality for this fascination, so they had to sort of degrade that in order to produce uh, these strange uh, transformations and sense of fragility to uh, the otherwise pristine and, and perfect digital mm -hmm. medium. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're, we're inside this transformative period between analog and digital, there are, and it's really uh, wonderful that some people are harvesting uh, some of the expressions that provide. Yeah, I think like for me, the w w what was quite shocking, you know, I mean, if you have like an old camera and you still can buy the film for that old camera, you're 
in sort in like in, in control of the pictures you take. But here I realized that Apple, they can do to what I call my world, because I spend so much time in that world, they can do whatever they want. Even if I even if I do not make the updates, you know, they change the quality of the pictures. So uh, um, they can do to my world whatever they want to do, you know, and they will change it uh, uh, over the years, even over the month. And uh, I might continue just like uh, uh, the collection because I think it's very interesting also to see how the quality of these images, how they, uh, how they evolve. And when I learned that all these images were gone, you know, I was like, like a, a, a mad woman. I was making like copies from all my pictures and hiding them in different places <laughs> because <laughs> I was so afraid that I would lose them. So I might continue just like by, yeah, observing what's going on in this world. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. That was fabulous. <laughs> um, <laughs> cheers, cheers. We can go this way. <laughs>